Good morning, good morning. How are you? And it's a very special day today. Yes, you guessed it. It's my birthday. And I'm going to work. Can you believe it? Can you Adam and Eve it? But you'll notice that the weather is absolutely gorgeous. As it always is on my birthday and various, you know, it starts the really nice weather in the UK starts on May the 18th. In case you're making any plans for weddings in future, holidays in the UK, etc. etc. Don't go in April, don't go in the first two weeks of May. So I'm 64, in case you're interested. I know I don't look it, I've had an easy life. I'm very, very uh, blessed with my good looks and my health. I'm very healthy, haven't taken a tablet, not on any medication, haven't had any operations, haven't even broken a bone. I've got that all ahead of me. <laughs> <coughs> so, how are you? Hope you're well. I hope you're as well as me, because I'm really well. I had a bloke in yesterday, younger than me, fitter than me, on statins, on blood pressure tablets, oh, you know. I think uh, I've been very lucky. I've dodged many, many bullets in terms of ill health. And the good thing about it is that the because the chances of you getting a certain disease are, you know, can be estimated and fixed at birth, as other people get that particular disease, the chances of you getting it go down. So every person that gets ill makes me healthier. That's a true fact. Statistically, that's absolutely true. In the same way as uh, because the chances of you dying at a certain age can be estimated and fixed at your birth, every time somebody else dies, it means that the chances of you living beyond that age go up, or living to that age go up. So it's good news when anyone else dies. But mainly, I put my longevity down to, because they always ask, don't they, when you get to be really old. And I know at 64, a lot of people listening to this, and certainly my grandchildren would say, I am very old. So I put the reason my longevity down, not only to other people dying before me, although this cough gets any worse, I might actually help someone else out. But um, I think it's my attitude to risk. We are very poor at dealing with risk as humans. We, are, we expose ourselves to a lot of risk, especially when we're young men, because we're trying to prove that we are fit to pass our genes on, that we're daring, we're strong. We will indulge in a fight if we need to you know, to protect the woman who's the mother of our children, etc, etc. And that's what the girls are looking for. They're looking for blokes with a bit of, uh, uh, I don't know, masculinity, I suppose, for want of a better word. A bit the ability to sort of protect them and, and, and won't, you know, allow someone to chuck a beer in their face in the pub. Um, so providing you get through that sort of the suicidal years, which are the sort of the late teens, very early 20s, um, then I think really you just, I classify a risk on a scale of A to Z, where A is absolutely zero risk of death, and Z is 100% certain risk of certain death, in the, you know, instantly. And so I try and classify all risk on this scale. Uh, a to Z, but I don't think most people really understand much about risk. So I put this down to my maths teacher, Mr. Carhill, 
Mr. Cahill, well, Carhill, whose father was a bookie who got into maths at a very young age and taught us uh, statistics and probabilities and which was more of an interest to me in the early days because of um, gambling. You know, the, the, uh, the, there are several stories about uh, people in the 18th century who um, understood the bell curve distribution of dice when you threw them. You know, the fact that it was you were very, very likely to throw a seven and very unlikely to throw a two or a twelve. And but but most people thought that you were equally likely to throw any number. And so by um, taking advantage of this uh, newly emerging science of probability and statistics, they managed to make themselves very wealthy. Now there's not really much uh, potential to do that these days because obviously all games of chance are probably better understood by the people hosting them than they are the people who play. But um, uh, that's what piqued my interest in it and I've always loved uh, uh, statistics and probabilities and things like that and found it very useful. And now I'm not saying that I am averse to risk. Uh, I'm not saying that I've lived a long time because I've padded myself in cotton wool because I haven't. I mean, you know, as a young man I had a, I've got a, I've got a full motorcycle license. So I had a, a Honda, uh, no, what was it, 650? 750 VFR, Honda 750 VFR as a young man. The fastest I've ever been on a motorcycle is 137 miles an hour. And to be honest with you, that's only because that was the top speed of the motorcycle. I would have gone faster if, if the bike could have gone faster. Um, uh, I've got a full pilot's license. And, you know, most people would balk that most people balk at the idea of riding a motorcycle. And you can imagine what they would say about the idea of getting a pilot's license and flying a plane. So, you know, look, some people would say, actually, I'm quite, I'm not really risk averse. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, I do indulge in uh, risky activities. But, but the point is that apart from a few like trivial accidents on the bike, such as, you know, the bike falling over at traffic lights, and stuff like that, um, I really haven't had any serious issues on the bike and I haven't really ever had any serious issues in the plane. Um, and that's because when I ride in a bike or drive in a plane, I tend to do it safely, by which I mean consciously and well within the limits of what's achievable, you know. I am, uh, I've got other pilot friends who go up and, you know, they, they enjoy flinging the plane about. They enjoy the steep turns and the stalls and the screeching about here, there and everywhere. And, um, uh, and every pilot knows a few other pilots who, you know, that they knew that have died. I mean, I know at least two off the top of my head straight away, local pilots. So you can't say it's, it's not a dangerous uh, endeavor, but on the other hand, providing you are very cautious and uh, methodical in your approach to it. it. It doesn't have to be as risky as most people imagine. Uh, so for example, I mean, you know, a lot of pilots will just chuck their bag in the plane, have a quick look around um, and uh, jump in and off they fly. Whereas with me getting in the air is a little bit more of a Zen-like ritual. I'm a bit more like, a <laughs> I don't quite count all the rivets on the plane, but but I do, uh, I do check it, you know what I mean? I'm a bit like a student in a way. I mean, I'm still really like acting as a flying student because I'm still doing everything really slowly and carefully. Whereas I probably don't need to. I probably could chuck my bag in, in the plane and just go flying occasionally, uh, providing I check it really clear, you know, closely uh, at other times. But um, no, we're, we're terrible. We are... Um, uh, really not, uh, I mean, in a way, I think obviously we are programmed to assess risk and deal with risk. Um, because otherwise, you know, well, what would we say, well, I'm not going through that jungle, for example, uh, because there may be spiders, tigers in there or something. Uh, and so we have like an inherent sense of immediate risk. But then 
other things that we are probably not quite so well equipped to deal with are like the risk of our house burning down or uh, the risk of there being really heavy traffic on the way to the airport and stuff like that um, and the risk that we are most badly adapted to deal with is the very very rare risk or which has very very uh, high impact consequences you know the sort of the um, uh, let's have a look some like some somebody just completely uh, falling asleep at the wheel and crossing three lanes and smacking into your car from the front going 70 miles an hour in the opposite direction those sort of risks very very rare but life-changing risks we tend not to uh, appreciate at all we tend to sort of bury our heads and hope that they're not going to happen and i must admit i'm as annoyed as anyone else that i've paid a lifetime's worth of household building insurance and never had to claim anything well not much anyway certainly not not i haven't had to pay for to have the whole house rebuilt which is which is the premium that is what the premium covers but you know some some uh, life-changing but extremely rare risks i have covered but then on the other hand other risks that other people would think i'm mad not to cover for example i never had life insurance um i don't think i'd know not even well i mean when i was really young uh, and i took out an endowment mortgage that came with life cover that paid the mortgage off uh, and probably would have paid a bit more than the mortgage off but really i've never had sort of standalone life cover and um, uh, i've never had uh, medical health insurance either which is you know and again a lot of dentists and members of Booper i know fair enough you know the, the the problem with these insurances and these uh, you can talk to people who are like in their 75 or so and ask them how it all went and they all say that they paid into the medical insurance all their life until they got to sort of 65 and then it got horrendously expensive like 15,000 pounds a year or something and so they then at that point decided that they were not going to bother you know they were going to go on the NHS and so this uh, sort of you, you tend to sort of get the idea that your premiums going to stay all the same all your life but you're going to get less in the early years and more in the later years and it's all going to balance out <coughs> but in fact that's not how it works at all Every year you pay a premium based on what you're likely to need in that year, and then, and as you get older, and they know, they know statistically. They don't know that you yourself personally are going to have a problem, but they know that statistically, in in the group of patients that you're a member of, a certain number of you are going to have a problem. And therefore, they ramp the premiums up to cover that. Plus, obviously, a bit of. Uh, uh, extra to uh, cover the admin plus a bit extra to cover their profits so um, and it's very difficult to justify that I think if you're a private medical uh, uh, insuree but I don't uh, so I've given something away there really which is what and if you're talking to me about dental plans this is relevant this is very relevant which is that uh, some people are naturally insurance minded and other people aren't and I'm not I'm not. I'm not a member of the AA. See, I don't have uh, insurance from the water board in case my pipes leak. I don't have uh, insurance on my boiler uh, in case my boiler blows up. I am lucky in a way that I could almost certainly afford to get towed away or have my water pipes repaired if they started leaking, etc., etc., etc. Therefore, I see insurance as a bad deal. And again, it all comes down to statistics. You know, statistically, I'm going to pay more in the long term for an insurance that covers me uh, for an event than, than I would pay for an event if I just paid for it as and when it occurred, assuming that I've got the funds to do it, you know, that I've got a little bit in reserve. And most, you know, dentists who've been in employment for 40 years have got enough money to pay for, a, get a pipe repaired even if they are driving a, a, a rickety old 
squeaky Peugeot partner van. Or almost certainly because they are driving a Peugeot partner van and not an Audi TT. Young dentist, please no. Treat yourself to a nice fast car. Lease a Porsche or whatever stupid thing you decide to do. But just be aware that when the lease runs out, you won't renew it because you'll you'll be glad to get rid of it. You'll be glad to get rid of that expensive boondoggle. So don't sort of swallow the old guff that uh, Derrin Pargeter used to spout from Denplan about how the best way to do a conversion is just to tell all your patients you're doing a conversion and then challenge them to either join then plan or go somewhere else. That is absolutely not the right way to do it. It's the best way for them plan, and that's the who she used to work for. So I don't blame her at all for saying that, but I do blame her for representing that as being in the dentist's best interest. Um, your my best estimate, one third of all the people who come through your door will be insurance minded. And the trouble is they won't be insurance minded for the right reasons. They'll be, what they'll do is they'll work out that, um, or they'll, they'll figure that um, if they can get on a dental plan, then it's a way of sort of spreading the cost out, which is, which is certainly is, but that's not the main reason to go on a preventive dental plan, I would say, is to reduce your level of decay and uh, gum disease. You know, to reward the dentist for prevention, get your mouth more healthy. The ideal dental plan patient is on the plan and has absolutely nothing done. In the same way as the ideal car driver is a member of the AA but never needs to be towed away. Why would you ring up the AA at the end of the year and say, do you know, I've paid you all this money but you haven't towed me away once? And you wouldn't, would you? And yet we still get patients who say, I, you know, well not so much these days, but who say, but I'm paying all this money but I'm not really getting much treatment in return. So what that does is that tells you that they're not mentally they're not in the same headspace as you. They're not they've joined it for reasons which are not the right reasons or not the reasons that you think that they they have joined. Um, they've joined because they think that you know perhaps they've had a big dental bill or they think they've got rock you know teeth well really high maintenance and they've joined to try and keep the cost down for the most part. The exact opposite of what I've said, you know, that, you know, you can pay your insurance gives you peace of mind and you pay a premium for that peace of mind. And you don't get anything for it other than peace of mind. So those people who say, well, I, I haven't had anything done, they're better off on a pay-as-you-go basis. And two thirds of the, uh, Look at these vans, like the vans here. Learn, learn how to drive. LGV, right? HGV, rather. And these vans used to come up and down this road, and now they've um, trained all their drivers, and they bought a load of vans, and nobody else needs training. They've just decided to park them by the side of the road, where they're like billboards, unregistered, unlicensed billboards. Clever. <laughs> Yeah, so two thirds of your patients are not are like me, not insurance minded. Uh, although they will, you know, take out insurance for various things. Um, one third of your patients, I would say, are are happier on a plan. Um, but the whole thing has changed anyway. Now, you know, when Dem Plan was uh, the only game in town, and then it spread into. Uh, Dental payment administration systems. Quentin Skinner went off, and and then uh, everybody set up their own type of plan. And then Simply Health came round and bought the whole bloody lot, so it became a monopoly again. Um, you're in those days. You know, uh, it was far easier to put someone on a plan because uh, uh, you see, saw more people on a regular basis and people are more interested in dental health. I think now uh, what you do is you tend to see a large number of people on an irregular basis, by which I mean, you know, your typical patient is a new patient, they need a ton of work, it can't be done on the plan, 
because they're not not a member of the plan at the point in there you know you discovered they needed doing although they can go on a plan but at that point why would you put them on a plan because they're they're an unquantifiable risk you can't work out what the risk premium is for someone on the plan if you don't know what their risk is so uh, So what happens is you give them like a one-off quote for a thousand or two thousand pounds or something, get them fixed up, get their fillings done, get their root treatments done, get their extractions done, and then um, then at that point they're fixed, aren't they? So they don't, you know, they then at that point then who's going to sign up on a plan when they know for a fact they've got to have nothing done, <laughs> but they've had it all done. They just uh, the dynamics of it don't work anymore. This is a new road they're putting it in here on the right lot. Can you see? We'll have a look later and see what they're doing. Fascinating. Mind you, we're going to need some new roads, I tell you, when you look at the back of the building. The building on the right there. The building in front there. I think they'll probably be building on the right hand side here because the, the fences have gone up, haven't they? Yep, that's all being built, although that might be road. They're building on the left here. And they're building on the uh, left once we go over the roundabout. And they're also building on the left after we go over the second roundabout and on the right. So all in all, there are 500 houses going up here. I don't know whether uh, that includes all of them, but at least I think there's probably at least 500 going on here. So don't let anybody tell you that uh, house building is in decline. It certainly it might be in decline where you are. It's not in decline around me. It's weird in a way because my surge is right in the middle of this lot. So and people are saying, oh, that's good. You're going to get all these new patients. Now, let me just correct you, okay? First of all, most dentists do not need any new patients, okay? It's like the old days when, uh, when people said, oh, I had all my fillings done because my dentist did all these fillings. They did them all unnecessarily. Now, I'm not saying that no dentist ever did a filling unnecessarily. You know, and if he was going to do an occlusal in the four, he didn't do an occlusal in the five and double his targi. But, you know, this idea that everybody uh, uh, has got mouths full of fillings that dentists did because they just felt like doing them, is completely wrong. Uh, Shanshi uh, confirmed that. And also, um, you know, I, I say to these patients, I was around then, you know, I was I was working in the uh, early early 80s, which was, you know, and so, and I was working with dentists, worked in the 70s and the 60s. And with the possible exception of the South Africans and the Australians, who were, uh, who came over and to be, let's say, highly productive and then earn a fortune and then go, go back home, you know, one step ahead of the DBB. Um, I've got to say that most dentists really didn't want to do any more work. They didn't want to take on any more fillings. You couldn't, there's no need for them to do unnecessary fillings. They had enough necessary fillings without doing unnecessary fillings. So that's all a bit of a myth, you know. Anyway, the solution is if you want to avoid uh, the allegation that you're doing unnecessary fillings, then get people on a dental plan because then the cost of any fillings comes out of your pocket and so they can't accuse you of profiteering because every filling you do makes you a loss. So, you know, that's why the system works so well. Not so much that, that it spreads the cost, although obviously it does at the same time. Right, okay, um, happy birthday to me. And I'll see you whenever. All right, nice to talk to you, bye.